All right. Well, hello and uh, welcome back. This is the uh, Digital Signature Podcast. Uh, this is our third uh, episode. And I'm happy to be joined today by uh, a, a colleague of mine, uh, Kelly Joyce, who's a professor of sociology at Drexel University and also the founding director uh, of the Center uh, for Science, Technology and Society. So, uh, Kelly, hi. Thanks for being here. How are you doing? Hey, it's my pleasure. Uh, so, um, so, so Kelly and I have worked together on on a lot of different projects, and we're gonna we're gonna talk about some of those today. Um, but uh, in particular, we're gonna focus in on um, the areas of artificial intelligence and machine learning. And uh, in particular, we're gonna look at uh, not only some of the, the technical aspects about what those things are and what those mean, uh, but more importantly, uh, Kelly's specialty is 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 in the area of of applying these these technological ideas. Um, through a broad uh, social and global lens, uh, and uh, uh, sort of ensuring that uh, uh, that those systems don't get used by even well-intentioned uh, technologists to do things that that weren't either not intended um, or that amplify uh, existing and and historical biases. So these systems, uh, although they're very powerful, um, they can do some pretty dangerous things, uh, and especially when they're they're in the hands of of people who aren't trained to understand how they affect the human. And so we're going to talk a lot today about how uh, computing and technology affects our own lives, us as humans uh, every day, um, and how we as technologists can be better trained uh, and, and just get a better eye, a better critical eye uh, to understand how we build and deploy these systems uh, in ways that are, are safer uh, to be used by all of us. Um, and uh, so um, before I get started there, uh, I'll say a quick word about what machine learning and, and, and AI uh, is. Um, so uh, artificial intelligence is, is kind of this broad uh, umbrella that describes uh, computer systems that can search for optimal solutions. So if you think about a computer playing chess uh, and figuring out the best chess move, um, well, that's an artificial intelligence problem. It's looking at all the different pieces it could move and maybe even like, well, if I move this piece, what would happen next? And what would I do about that? And you can sort of look around for the best answer as far out as you can. And the further you can go, you know, the better you'll do. Um, and machine learning is kind of like a subset of that, that uh, thinks about how to um, make decisions. Uh, so if you have uh, a system like um, uh, maybe it maybe it looks at a, a picture and it tries to figure out if it's a cat or a dog and you could show it a lot of different pictures of cats and dogs and you tell it these are all dogs and these are all cats, um, you know, it'll try to learn things about them. Uh, as humans, we would think like, OK, a cat maybe has a shorter thinner tail or smaller ears or, you know, something like that. We would try to figure out these little differences. Um, and uh, and computers can can actually do things like that. Uh, and, and if you give it a new picture, it'll try to figure out what that cat or dog is. Or um, maybe if you're sitting at home, you might have some coins in your pocket. Uh, you could pick out a coin and without looking at it, you know, just kind of close your eyes. You could hold it in your hand and you could say, well, that's a penny or a dime or a quarter or whatever, you know, maybe a coin in uh, whatever country you're watching this from. You could, you could, if you know what those coins are like, you could touch one and feel the thickness and the weight and the diameter. And you'd kind of know, I think that's a quarter. I think that's a dime. Um, it's actually a lot harder to do that with a dollar bill. You imagine like pulling out of your pocket and you have a bunch of dollar bills. You say, I'm going to get a, I need a $5 bill. Um, you have to kind of look at it to know what it is. You can't just feel it. They're they're mostly the same size and thickness, as, at least as far as I can tell. Um, and it's really hard to tell those apart. So, um, so machine learning kind of works by trying to look at differences in examples um, in history. And then it tries to use those examples to make kind of general predictions about new, uh, new information. And so you could imagine this gets used all over the place uh, from, uh, you know, making uh, credit decisions, uh, if someone's opening a bank account, uh, uh, maybe college admissions, um, all kinds of things where these systems can look at what's been done before and what should I do now. And uh, and so where um, where STS comes in, and, and Kelly, I'd like maybe you can you can speak a little bit to this, um, is to 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 address uh, and and hopefully mitigate some of the challenges uh, in using machine learning uh, on decisions that can affect humans. So, um, so what are some of the the challenges that you see with using systems like these, these machine learning systems, um, in areas that um, you know potentially could interact or sort of are human facing uh, decision type problems? Yeah, sure. So, 
One of the things about um, any of these systems when they're working on human data, human data is always about inequalities. And I don't know how or if that's taught in computer scientists, it's computer science. So one of the things we know from science technology studies or sociology is that human data is always about inequalities and it's sort of baked in in very subtle ways. So zip codes, for example, don't just tell you about where people live. In the United States, it also tells you about racial, racial segregation, class segregation, because we live in segregated neighborhoods. If you don't know that and you think zip codes are neutral, you might build a machine learning system that then amplifies racial or economic disparities because it thinks that is normal and not, not recognizing that that's actually like not normal and we wanna address that. Um, in the same way, healthcare data, um, it's patient records are incredibly social objects. And so they're really um, useful bits of data, but if you don't understand about how inequality is built into them, you might unintentionally exasperate inequalities if you build a machine learning system that just runs on patient records as if patient records are objective neutral truths. Uh, they aren't, right? So again, we know that um, people's response to treatments, what people get as treatments when they go to the hospital is uh, based on race and class. And so um, white people might get better treatments, wealthier people might get, get better treatments, um, and they might have better health, health outcomes, not just because of the better treatments, but because their life circumstances are better. Maybe they live in less polluted neighborhoods. Maybe they have access to more nutritious food. Their jobs aren't as dangerous. So if you don't understand that patient records are actually encoding all the inequalities that are built into society, then you can't create a machine learning system that will address it. And unfortunately it might exasperate it. So one of the things that's concerned us in STS and sociology is that machine learning can result in inequalities on steroids. And what I mean by that is that because machine learning works so fast and um, accelerates sort of the feedback loops of decision-making, it can make inequality worse because now you have doctors being recommended to do X, Y, or Z treatments that are actually only going to uh, in increase the racial disparities in healthcare, which was never the intention, right? Yeah, that's a really good point. I I'm reminded of... Uh an article um, that uh, that I, I that we've both read uh, that um, I, I, I'll link to it in the description, but it was about um, how uh, a machine learning system was looking at X-ray images and it was predicting race, and uh, and the we're not aware physiologically of anything from a, an image like an X-ray that would lead one to be able to predict someone's race, and so it raises some questions about. What exactly is it looking for to do that? And uh, and we don't necessarily know. And uh, and that's uh, that's that's one of the challenges with these systems is um, you can you can choose uh, the data that yield these examples, um, but you don't always have direct control over how it's using those. Uh, those data to figure out how to make the decision. So it's kind of looking at everything and it, and 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 you can kind of uh, end up with uh, historic systemic biases that are built into that data. Um, like as, as Kelly said, these uh, electronic health records, and you don't really know what it's teasing out from that. If it's just looking at, maybe it figures out that zip code becomes a predictor uh, of, of, of health outcomes. And so it starts making decisions that are just based on zip code because it does such a good job of, uh, of making those predictions. And that's all it cares about is, is what gives me the, the most accurate answer according to all the examples that I've ever seen. And uh, so it's a little bit hard to audit and impeach those systems and really ask, you know, how'd you come to that decision? Um, and so I'm, I'm kind of uh, also reminded of some, some work that, that we've done uh, on a project uh, at Drexel called the Belly Band. And that's a, a wearable device um, with a, a, a knitted, uh, antenna. So we actually can can knit some uh, a thread through a shirt in the shape of an antenna, like a radio antenna, um, and actually look at the way it reflects wireless signals um, to figure out uh, someone's heartbeat or respiratory behavior or a uterine contraction for a mom in labor and all kinds of really neat uh, biomedical things. And uh, um, and what I thought was so much fun about that project, which is still ongoing, we're still working on that, but. Uh, is that uh, it, 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 you, it, it put around the table people who worked in just, you know, vastly different fields. So there would be an electrical engineer and a computer scientist and a sociologist and a physician and everybody around the table. And, and just this um, kind of 
kind of microcosm of all of the, the different skill sets that are needed to address a problem like that. No one person can do this on their own. Um, and uh, But that leads to some challenges too, which is that many of the people around that table uh, are not the stakeholder. They're not the person that's going to use that system. So, uh, you know, like uh, I'm not a, a pregnant mom, so I don't know uh, what that's like to use. I don't know much about the kind of data that a physician would look for while they're, um, you know, while they're while they're um, doing that monitoring. And uh, um, and yet they need me at the table to do, you know, to kind of bring the logic and the math that I bring, uh, you know. So I'm an important part of that team, but not. Uh, not enough to fully understand how it how it affects um, uh, people, and what that what that made me realize was that throughout my training, which was wonderful, uh, I didn't really get a lot of background in these kinds of issues. Uh, so I learned a lot about the technical aspects of of how machine learning works and statistics and all that kind of stuff, um, but not so much about how to make sure that I'm making decisions that are even relevant uh, to the stakeholder. And uh, so I guess I wonder like, why why do you think that, why, why do you think that gap exists? And is STS a program that is the Center for Science, Technology and Society? Like, is that a program that is intended to address those kinds of gaps or or is it uh, is it something different? Yeah, well, I think part of the reason the gap exists is because the computer science and engineering curriculum is so stacked. There really isn't a lot of room for electives. And even when there is, it might feel uncomfortable to get outside of, of one zone and take a humanities or social science class. And so I really think, you know, if we really want to address some of these issues, we have to unpack the curriculum a little bit so that students can double major, even when they're majoring in computer science or in engineering. And I think um, that would really result in people who have knowledge and the same vice versa is also true so that the sociologists could double major in computer science, right? It just, it's really hard to do that at most universities at this point. So I think that's part of the reason the gap exists is the curriculum. I think another is just, we like what we like and we feel comfortable doing it. You know, I, I really enjoy the social science classes. I also enjoy STEM, but I think I'm a little bit of an outlier. I think people really feel comfortable in the lab or they feel comfortable in their literature class and, and then they don't. And so getting outside our comfort zone, and I think universities can really message that in multiple ways, one through advising, but also through, you know, joint teaching, which is something you and I did build um, when we got the grant from the um, Colonial Academic Alliance to develop curriculum that integrated your expertise in machine learning and my expertise in STS and sociology around health. And I, that took a lot of work, but I think that models for the students that both are equally valued and one's not an add-on. So I think I think there's a lot of things built into our educational and our sort of just personalities that lead to that gap, but it is addressable um, with some institutional change. The other thing I would just say though, and, and this goes back to the belly band project, you know, one of the things big companies like Google and Microsoft are wrestling with is how do we do ethical AI? And you've heard that phrase and you've seen it in the news. And lots of times what they do when they talk about it is they individualize it. And by that, I mean, they say, oh, we just have to get the computer scientists to understand ethics better so they don't make up these systems that create inequalities, et cetera. So it becomes an individual problem of training. And if we train better, and you know, I personally just, I think that's great. I think it's great that people, companies are recognizing that's a problem and curriculum, but I don't think it's the answer and I don't think it's fair. So I think computer scientists have expertise in computer science. Do they really have to have... Um, in-depth, you know, expertise in human data, social science, et cetera. And I, what I liked about our belly band project, it didn't ask you as the computer scientist to suddenly become an expert in sociology. It didn't ask me as a sociologist to become an expert in computer science. We had to become literate, but we could, we depended on each other to bring the expertise to the team's research and design. And I just think that way of doing it is probably, um, a little more humane. <laughs> so, so, so everybody doesn't have to become everything, but I think it's also just, it recognizes expertise. So one of the things a social scientist brings to these teams is expertise in how to systematically study the stakeholders and bring their points of view in. Um, and the second thing is that a social scientist often brings domain expertise. So when they're studying, say, old people, they understand a lot of things that are happening in the lived experiences of elders' lives or how they're navigating their houses or transportation that you would never get in a survey or just from doing a, a lit review. And so 
I think that combination of domain expertise and um, methodological expertise is really crucial. And I just think it's it's not reasonable to expect a computer scientist and engineer to learn all that when it takes degrees in those disciplines to develop those skills. So I, I really, I appreciate what Google and Microsoft are doing. I just don't think it's really going to get the kinds of results they're hoping for. I think it'd be better to always make sure you integrate different kinds of expertise on the team the way we did with the belly band. And, you know, the National Science Foundation was really excited to fund that because we did do that. They under The foundation understood that we were taking this seriously. I, I'm really glad you bring that up because I, I think about that a lot. And I, I wondered if maybe it was uh, imposter syndrome or, or something like that. And I, I was planning on asking you this, uh, so I will. Um, which is that, you know, like I'm, I'm a CS faculty and I teach computer science courses and, um, and, you know, in recent years, mostly thanks to my work with you, I, I've been sort of getting out of that comfort zone to try to have those conversations and, and think a little more deeply and critically about uh, the, not only how to develop these systems, but the way we deploy them. Uh, but I, I think one of the barriers that I had there was that, um, you know, you, I know that I don't know what I don't know. And uh, and I also know that I'm not an expert in in that space. And uh, and and and, you know, I've certainly become more literate there, like you said. But, uh, you know, I think as professors, we're, we're we're really reluctant to talk about things that we don't feel like we're the the you know, the biggest authority. And uh, and so that that, you know, almost kind of ironically leads us to shy away from some of these topics where uh, we could do a lot of good and we have a lot to bring and we, you know, we know what the state of, of the art is, but we, but we don't do it because we want to focus on the thing that we are the expert at. And uh, um, I think that speaks directly to the way I've been feeling that, uh, you know, if, if we, if we put this solely on the, the technologist or solely on the sociologist, I, I, I think we lose because there's a, uh, there's a, there's a piece missing there and that it's it's really about bringing those two audiences together um, and getting them to um, to collaborate. So um, well, I'm glad you say that. So uh, so anyway, my I guess my question is because you kind of started to answer it. Um, you know, is uh, if if I'm a if I'm a teacher and this could be K twelve or at the university level, um, but if I'm a teacher and I'm teaching you know a, a technology class of some kind. Um, what are some things that I can do uh, in my classroom to kind of bring some exposure to these issues uh, to get my students started down a path like that, to get them, you know, just a little more literate uh, um, so that they can they can have these more intelligent conversations? Yeah, so there's a great uh, website that's free and open to the public called Online Ethics Center, and it's hosted by the University of Virginia. And so they host uh, they curate and then host ethics case studies around a, a range of issues. And um, and like I said, they also come with um, some teaching materials. So that's one thing I would recommend is you could take a look at that resource and then download some cases and some of the, the teaching materials and try them out. The other thing I'd recommend is, you know, getting to know colleagues in the social sciences or STS, if you have that kind of program at your university, because then you could have guest lectures. Um, you could team teach a module, you could start to build those connections. I think what happens in the universities is, is computer scientists take their one, you know, humanities or social sciences elective, and then the social science and humanities major take their one you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> computer science elective. And it really feels very separate and not connected to the main work they're doing in their majors. And I think one of the ways we can start to challenge that is by doing some limited team teaching. Universities don't like it when we team teach the whole course because they can't figure out how to count courses, et cetera. But I think there's ways to do modules or to do guest lectures that start to open up those conversations um, in productive ways. So those would be the two things that I would recommend. Yeah, they, these are great ideas. I know I'm, I'm fortunate I'm uh, where I am now. Uh, we have a structure called a linked inquiry course, and, and there's actually a structure to do those kinds of things. And um, so I've been, I've been thinking about like doing a uh, computing and and physics, that kind of thing, or computing and education, um, and uh, 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 a sort of computing and sociology like design thinking course would be would be amazing. And um, not to plug our own thing, but uh, you know we had an amazing experience uh, co teaching, and you you brought it up a few minutes ago. Um, a uh, course in um, uh, we sort of visited somebody's uh, global health uh, course. And uh, they were gracious enough to host us for a couple of weeks, and uh, uh, that that was an amazing experience for me. I, I, I you know, it was uh, largely uh, um, uh, sociology students, 
and uh, we gave a, a little crash course in machine learning and, and then dug into those uh, those issues. And I thought we made all this headway in both spaces, but I, I thought I learned a ton. I, I, I almost was, you know, I was sort of sitting there asking myself, like, am I learning more than they are right now? Because I'm, I'm getting such a perspective from, from them that I didn't have. And it, it definitely underscores the need to get these people in the room and, and, and be multidisciplinary. And, and so, uh, so yes, if you're a, if you're a higher ed or a K-12 administrator watching this, you know, get, uh, get interdisciplinary. I think that's, uh, that's some shared advice that, that we would have here. Um, I think if I can speak for, for yeah, Kelly. And, and support it and support it. And, yeah. um, you know, I'm just thinking, Bill, as you talk out loud is at Drexel, we were starting to think about, uh, high school camps and arts and sciences. And this, the kind of two week module you and I did would be so fantastic high school because really bringing them together and getting them early before they even go to college. Yeah, anyway. that's right. It, yeah, it's got me thinking we should um, take a look at some of those materials we had put together and uh, and uh, it'd be a blast to think about how to how to uh, make that uh, into a, a broadly accessible um, set of activities uh, and, uh, and, and make that public. That'd be a lot of fun. I, I'd love to do sure. that. One thing, you know, one thing I've noticed about computer science is it's done a fantastic job of of teaching students to think about societal impact, right? That's one of the criteria when you're looking at senior projects. And I think where we can push more on that and build on it is that, well, how are you thinking about societal impact? So it could be doing a lit review, which is really important. But how about partnering with somebody from the social sciences or STS and getting their expertise? How would they go and figure out societal impact? How would they actually scientifically study that? Um, one of the other things I've seen with computer sciences is they might put a domain expert. Like, so in the case of our belly band project, they put a doctor on the team because that doctor was going to then represent the clinic, the hospital. But that's only one, per that's not actually scientific. It's good to have that perspective, but it's not actually scientific. So there's these moves in computer science to really think seriously about societal impact. And I think we could build on those so that that addressing of societal impact is actually more scientific. So instead of the one expert or just the lit review, like really bringing in the social science methods, how do you critically evaluate what the impact will be? Because, you know, we've all been around the block and we know that you can build wonderful things that nobody wants and that's a failure, or you could build something you think is wonderful, but then wreaks havoc on the community you're trying to engage. And that's not what a technologist wants either. So I think that's why bringing in an STS perspective can be really valuable because then you're actually accomplishing what you want to accomplish as a computer scientist or as an engineer. And I'll say the flip side of this is that STS and sociologists, sociologists more so can be kind of negative, like, oh God, machine learning, there's no good, let's just push it out. And that's not accurate either, right? Like there's a lot of good work that machine learning can do. Um, it is not a blanket negative and it's not a blanket positive, but how can we get past that tendency to do, see things in black and white and really think about, so where is machine learning appropriate? Where can it add? One of the things that concerns me is that um, lots of times in the United States, machine learning is seen as a way to replace human labor. So the reason hospitals, companies, governments, police forces, public transportation like machine learning is because they can get rid of the public transportation workers. We just had an example of that in Philadelphia where they've gotten rid of all these SEPTA workers that are usually on the subway platforms. There's an increase in crime and violence. So they've just bought an AI system to try to manage this. And it's like, well, I mean, Bill, you're the one that taught me this too. And you, one of the things you said to me early on is like, when you think about what is machine learning good for in healthcare, if they start saying replacing human expertise, the clinicians, you're already in trouble. It should always be supporting the human beings. Am I, am I characterizing that correctly? Or oh, ever? yeah, I, I, you know, it's uh, so often we hear like uh, people will say, oh, you know, oh, we're afraid that the, the AI is going to rise up and, and, and take over and we're going to be powerless and, you know, all these terrible things are going to happen when the robots become sentient and, and that kind of thing. And, and I think, uh, you know, the, the question I think we should be asking, the thing that, that I would be a, a kind of afraid of is, will we allow these systems to erode our sense of critical thinking? You know, will we allow it to replace, uh, you know, uh, human discernment, uh, and uh, and 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 move it from a place of support to a place of replacement. I, I think that's spot on. And if uh, you know, and if if we do that, and we just kind of um, accept uh, 
the decision it makes, you know, and I, how, how many times have you gone to a, uh, you know, a, a school office to get something done or a, or a bank if you're in, if you're one of the adults uh, and, and they say, well, you know, that's what the computer says. And so that's, that's the way it is. And that's just such a frustrating experience. And so to me, the risk of using AI and machine learning is that we, we amplify and exacerbate uh, those issues, um, especially with the, the potential it has. And we've seen this, um, you know, across uh, uh, axes that uh, that can um, you know further uh, place uh, at, at risk persons um, in in danger of harm. Uh, so yeah, uh, yeah I, I totally agree. We we need the human in the loop. This is not about replacing workforce. Um, if if anything, I, I think it's augmenting it to make sure we're doing it right. I, I just couldn't agree more. Yeah, and I think it's something for people to watch out for when somebody's pitching a new platform. If they're pitching it at replacing labor workers, paid paid expertise, paid human expertise, uh, antennas should go up right away because probably that's not going to play out the way they hope. Um, and I, I understand you have to pitch, you have to sell your product, but that's that's already a sign that this is not going to go the way it could go and, and be a really supportive, um, helpful platform or software in, in a particular social world like healthcare or city government, et cetera. Um, the other thing though, I'm glad you brought this up is that Part of the reason we defer to machine learning is because we already live in this cultural milieu where we think technology is objective at best. Mm -hmm. And at worst, we think it's better than human judgment and human expertise. And so one of the things we do in STS is we spend a lot of time trying to scientifically analyze what kind of values are being placed on technological systems. And those change over time. Like this, what we live in right now has not always historically been true. But right now, we live in a, a cultural context where we are socialized to believe that technology is objective and neutral and it's better than human beings. And that plays into how people perceive what machine learning is and can do. And I think to your point, Bill, to, to our detriment, because if we start believing it, that the uh, machine learning output is correct and it's not, we have a problem. And this is really a problem when you think about inequalities in society, racial, gender, class inequalities. Um, if we devise systems that are unintentionally exasperating those, but we believe the technology is neutral, it gets harder and harder to try to argue that, no, it's not neutral. It's having this effect. And we, we can figure out ways to address it, but you can't figure out ways to address it if you're not even engaging the fact that it's not objective or neutral. So one of the founding tenets of STS is that there is no such thing as an objective neutral technology. It is always intertwined with society. We often use the phrase society and technology are co-produced. They are always together. And that sometimes the reaction to that claim is, well, what are you saying? Technology is not good. It's like, no, absolutely not. Technology is very useful. Technology is part of how we live our lives. It's part of how we do our identities, but it is still part of society. And I think that knee-jerk rea reaction to say, say, well, if you're saying society and technology are intertwined, then you're saying technology sucks is already very interesting. Like, why does why because we say it's it's a social product does that mean it sucks? It doesn't, right? No, I think that there's a there's really a a, a hopeful message here. As much as you know, we've been talking a lot about the. Uh, the risks and challenges, but where those challenges are, there are there are opportunities, and uh, and and so if you're a, a guidance counselor, a teacher, a parent, or a student, and you're 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 hearing this, it's you know the message is definitely not that we should cut back on our use of machine learning and artificial intelligence. Uh, it's it's here to stay, and we've done. Uh, wonderful things with it, uh, but uh, you know, and and I've spent my career in this in this space, uh, so I'm certainly not wishing it away. But uh, but that I've also been trying to spend my career becoming more literate uh, in the ways in which that it, it, you know it gets deployed and 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 who it affects and uh, and and how it affects them and and how I can better understand those things uh, so that I can make better choices along the way uh, throughout the design process and also so that we can better identify disparities if they're happening and and correct them and so uh so if you're so as you're you're listening to this it's it's uh, i think the message is that we we need people like you to be to be willing to step up and say you know i'm interested in doing uh computing and and machine learning work in the workforce uh but 
to to but to do it in a way where where you're also uh, uh, kind of literate in these uh, these sort of sociological aspects, or uh, you could have a whole career focusing on this space in what what I call from my biased lens the other direction, you know, from uh, from from the position of the the global impact and have that literacy and technology and work side by side with the people writing the code. And uh, uh, I I think the message here is that 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 work is as important and I think in a lot of ways more important than writing the code. Uh, and so um, so if you if you find yourself fascinated by the technology, but thinking about it in a way like, you know, it's it's what what excites me isn't so much that I'm, I'm typing out the code and writing it and running it, but I get excited about the idea of real humans are going to use this and I want to better understand how they use it and 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 how I can make sure that it's that it's helping them and doing this in productive ways. Um, this is a career pathway and uh, and and uh, it's it's one that I think, doesn't get the spotlight on it in K-12 or even in higher ed uh, right now the way that that it probably should. And, uh, um, and and obviously Kelly has been working really hard to uh, to address those gaps. Um, I think we have we have a long way to go. And, and so we wanted to share this so that you can you can think about it from from where you are, because there's there's a lot of opportunity there. And it's, uh, I think, relatively untapped. Uh, so, uh, Kelly, that actually gets me to my, my last question for you, too, which is, um, what about the person for whom it's too late to do this in school? So like someone like me, I'm already on the other side. I'm not going to go back to school. Uh, I'm not going to, you know, do a minor or take a class or something like that. Um, but I'm interested in learning more about how maybe I as a practitioner can become more literate in this space um, or just how I as somebody in the community can better understand what the issues are that are that are facing these people so that I can be a better, um, a, a better input as a member of the community. Uh, are there... Um, are there resources that that they can go to to get some some background uh, in this space and learn more? Absolutely. So because this is such an important issue for our times, um, there's been some good documentaries and shows on this. One is uh, Coded Bias is a fantastic documentary um, that looks at the unintentional coding of bias into um, machine learning and other kinds of systems. Another show that's worth checking out is called Automating Racism, and that is available on YouTube for free. Um, I think some of the more critical news sources have been covering it as well. Uh, the New York Times, um, the New Yorker, there people are paying attention to this because it is reshaping our world as, as institutions and governments buy um, machine learning systems and start to use them in their arenas, they're having effects, positive and negative. And so there's just a lot of discussion about it. The other thing is pay attention to your local universities. You have a lot of wonderful resources with professors who are studying um, these, get on the listservs, go to the talks. They're all open and to the public. Um, we do it all the time at Drexel and so do most universities. So take advantage of your university resources. Libraries are another uh, source of uh, civic engagement in the United States, and they, they are starting to feature speakers that take on some of these issues. So pay attention to what's happening in, in, in your geography, in your geographical space, and, and go check it out because you know this is what it means to be a member of our society in the 21st century is to understand um, the kind of social impact of machine learning and what it's gonna mean for your communities around you. Yeah, thanks for that. I and I'll I'll check in uh, a couple of those I knew and a couple of those I didn't. So uh, I'll uh, I'll uh, we'll chat uh, offline and I'll I'll collect some of those links and uh, make sure they're available in the uh, the video description for folks who are watching this. Uh, and... One more thing, Bill, I just want to add because I know you are going to link to it is um, Alondra Nelson, who's a sociologist and STS scholar, has been the head of our federal science and policy um, office, and she has helped put forward a oh gosh. It's a human rights for artificial intelligence. Uh, this is not the right, hold on a second. But it is amazing and it spells out, I mean, it. it's amazing that she was appointed the head of this office and, and that she was able to bring this expertise and I think speaks to what you've been saying, Bill, which is this expertise is really important. You can't just do computer science without this other knowledge and uh, fields. And um, let's see. Yeah, I'm not familiar with this one, so uh, I'm I'm uh, I'm interested yeah, it, to see it myself. Yeah, and you know, even like P, uh, NPR shows like Science Friday have been having people like uh, Professor Nelson on um, because this issue is just so important. And, and like I said, it's it's you know, it's very seldom that you have 
you know, bad actors or like technologists who want to devise systems to increase inequalities in your world. That's not, that's actually not what's happening. Right. And so people really don't want to devise. Um, okay. So it's uh, artificial intelligence bill of rights. And it's from um, the Federal Office of Science and Technology Policy, of which Alondra Nelson is the head right now. And that's a political appointee. Right. And um, it's just very exciting. And it's been getting a lot of press. So I think if you pay attention to some of these um, some of these things as they're happening in, in the press, in the more critical press, you, you can really start to learn a lot about what's, what's happening and in the impact of, of, of the systems you're making. Yeah, that's that's uh, interesting. Yeah, I'll uh, I, I'll look at that uh, myself, but uh, I'll be sure to share it here too. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, well, uh, so I guess why don't we leave it there? I think uh, we've we've uh, I, I have so many more questions I I want to ask, but I I think uh, I think we're already uh, uh, way over time, which is uh, what what tends to happen when you have interesting things to say. So um, so uh, Kelly, thank you for uh, for for taking the time here. I always learn so much when we talk. So uh, this is uh, this is a real perk of this uh, job for me. Thank you for joining me. Oh, my pleasure, Bill. I always learn too. It's a mutual learning experience. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, it's uh, it's uh, it's 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 really uh, it really and uh, and seriously, it, it's changed the way that I I sort of view my my career on the the research and development side. It's uh, you know this 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 having this kind of education, even though it was after I graduated, you know, it it uh, it just helped me so much to um, just be able to do what I do in ways that are actually effective. Because, like, and you just said it that you know nobody. Um, I, I shouldn't say nobody, but hopefully very few to nobody, you know, sits down and says, I want to build something that is bad. Uh, you know, it's, uh, but, but bad things happen and it, and it's, you know, it's uh, uh, these, these oversights can become very quickly amplified, um, especially when you have baked in biases to amplify, because those are the examples that it's looking at. And so, um, and, and these may be things that happened in our society before the programmer was even born, you know? So it's like, how do we even expect them to know that these are risky things uh, because they weren't there to experience uh, the, the way it happened. And uh, um, so having having that perspective is so helpful. And uh, I, I hope that, uh, you know, if you, if you have students that are kind of thinking about these broader uh, kinds of implications of technology, uh, point them to some of these resources, uh, uh, get them in touch with us. Uh, we, we have a lot to say about this and, uh, and there are certainly a lot of opportunities and ways to get involved. No, one thing I just want to end on is one of the things that was so helpful in terms of our discussions and process, I, we, artificial intelligence and machine learning is billed as a technology of the future. It is going to create futures. And that's the way it's been talked about and sold. And one of the things that was most startling uh, to me that I learned from working with you um, is that it's actually a technology of the past. If you don't think about how human data is always data about inequalities, you are not, when you build a machine learning system, you're building a technology of the future that recreates the inequalities of the past. And I think the challenge for computer scientists and sociologists and STS scholars is if we really wanna build machine learning systems that produce a more equitable future, we cannot do machine learning the way it's being done right now. Yeah, it makes a lot and of I sense. I think we all want that. We want a technology of the future that doesn't just recreate the past. Right. And so the question is, how do we do that? And I think the work you're doing is really laying out a path forward. So thank you. Yeah. Well, and, and thank you. Yeah. And there are, um, <laughs> and that, that leads to a, a whole other uh, subject. And yeah, that's a, that's a whole area of research uh, um, on the uh, machine learning side of things is, uh, you know, can, can systems be developed that can learn without uh, having to be based or at least not as heavily uh, on um, historical examples um, and they're called uh, unsupervised uh, learning models. And uh, so, you know, so there, there is hope there too. Uh, they, that has its challenges as well. We could, we could have, well, there are whole graduate semesters that, <laughs> that talk about that. So I won't try to do that here, but, uh, uh, but yeah, it's, uh, you know, there, I think there's a hopeful message there too, um, in, in that this is being addressed from both the technical side and the sociological side. And I think our message here is that uh, we'd really like to see those two um, uh, groups have seats at a common table and uh, that that will really accelerate things and uh, and so you at home have a chance to be a part of that movement and uh, something uh, something to think about so 
Uh, Kelly, thank you. <laughs> thank you for being here. Uh, and uh, and thank you all for being here. This is uh, the, the Digital Signature Podcast. You can find uh, this and more, as well as uh, some activities you can try at home uh, at digitalsignature.fm. Uh, and uh, you can reach out to me anytime. I'm at uh, bill at digitalsignature.fm. We look forward to hearing from you and uh, seeing you next time. Take care.